speaker, who is Rachel O'Toole, uh, currently an NEH fellow at the library, uh, but a um, former fellow as well, uh, NEH fellowship from the J uh, at the JCD in 2004. She is currently, that is when she is not on fellowship, associate professor of history at the University of California at Irvine, where she teaches classes on sex and conquest, race and empire, indigeneity, coloniality, and in the Atlantic and Pacific worlds. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2001 in history, um, previously having studied at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where she received her BA in history and Latin American studies. Um, her, mon her, her monograph found lives, Africans, Indians, and the making of race in colonial Peru uh, received uh, a um, 2013 prize from the Latin American Studies Association Peru section, um, and as well as the Latin American Studies Association uh, Flo uh, Flora Tristan Book Prize. She's uh, edited a variety of different uh, works um, on African diaspora, on slavery, indigenous politics, and gender influences on racial constructions. And that is uh, all of those thematic uh, uh, links and connections are the backdrop for her talk today, which is entitled Transgressing the Household, the Laws of Slaveholding and the Practices of Freedom in Colonial Peru. So with that, please join me. <coughs> audience that historians both read from their talks and do not use enough images. Um, so you will all forgive me in advance for being who I am. I'm a historian who depends on text. So there is a handout going around and you will excuse me in advance. I also want to start by thanking Neil and Ken and Val and Brenda and all the librarians and staff of the John Carter Brown Library for their assistance and work. Welcome. I also need to thank my compañeros y compañeras. As part of our orientation as fellows, we are encouraged to submit our reading experiences or discoveries as many essays to the page I found it at the JCD on the library's website. And this is a great idea. But I'm actually, but given the encouraging fellowship of my fellow fellows, I wonder if Neil would consider adding other pages that commemorate the other treasures of the collection, including the intellectual exchange of the library. So I'm thinking along the lines of, I fought it at the JCD. <laughs> I wrote it at the JCD. <laughs> Danny told me it this at the JCD. <laughs> Tessa made me think of this idea at the JCD. Alcira taught me how to translate Tenedor de los Bienes, and et cetera. So I really thank my compañeros. It's great to be here. In this current book project, I'm asking a very simple question. What was freedom of some very complicated people? Africans and their descendants, enslaved and free, men and women and children of the colonial city of Trujillo on the northern Peruvian coast. And these maps are from the fabulous <coughs> JCB collections and even more fabulous digital collection. Um, so here's a punch, you gotta go look at that digital collection. Um, this area is a provincial crossroads of highland and Dian trade, and this is kind of the northern coast of Peru, and here I'm looking at you know, these coastal valleys up here in the north towards what is today Ecuador. This was a provincial crossroads of highland and Dian trade and coastal Pacific traffic, and what makes the northern Peruvian irrigation, irrigated plains so interesting in the 17th century is that Africans and their descendants worked on sugar plantations, wheat farms, mule trains, and in household service, making up about 50% of the total population. Now, this is hardly an anomaly. The northern Peruvian coast reflects what is happening, actually, I would argue, throughout uh, Spanish America in the 17th century. That is dynamic, interconnected, regional economies. Those of us who study the 17th century know that the Crown complained that there was nothing going on, well, there was nothing coming to them, but there was a lot happening in the Americas. And then in the case of the Trujillo region, what was happening is they were responding in shifts to the decline of silver in Potosi, as well as the kind of 
boom in the, in the arrival of the Manila galleons to the north in Mexico, as well as other um, shifts in the local economy. This afternoon, what I want to do is I want to work through these four points with a particular focus on how women and men of the African diaspora in colonial Peru intervened in the laws of manumission. And the first one I want to start with is this archive of uncertain freedom. I've begun to hypothesize that legal manumission was a freedom that counted, but it was an uncertain freedom. And what I have found that's not surprising to many historians of slavery is that as the northern Peruvian coast economy in wheat and sugar expanded by the 1660s into the Caribbean and the transatlantic slave trade was re-legalized and re-established by the 1670s, more people, especially women, secured documentation of a legal transition of either their own person or a family member into the status of free. And this handout, I know uh, the PowerPoint is different to read, so I've kind of got a lot of this stuff in the handout so you can look as well. And this is a count of the Cactus de Libertad, or the official individual manumission agreements, as well as the testaments or agreements in the manumission that are individually freeing a person, or sometimes a, a group of persons. And there's a lot to talk about here, but what I'm pointing out here is that, like other parts in the Americas, more women than men are getting their official legal manumission. And these patterns fit with other historians have found throughout the Americas, including Mexico and Lima, that women more than men were able to purchase their legal manumission at rates between 35% to 31% higher than men of color. And this makes sense because as slaves, women of color can work for wages. They transform their time into cash and credit to purchase their freedom and those of their family members. So if you can believe this, especially if you know my math skills, I am in the process of counting all these letters of freedom and grantings of freedom in wills from the 1640s to the 1720s. And building off of this extensive scholarship of counting these freedoms, I intend to explore for example, in this quantitative analysis of manumission, Trey Proctor, for example, has correlated the sex of the slaveholder to the sex of the manumitted in colonial New Spain to find that women more often than men manumitted slaves and more often enslaved people, regardless of their sex, raised in households were manumitted. So there's a lot to do with this kind of quantitative analysis. But my additional point is that rather than counting the data points extracted from legal manumission recorded in notary records, such as the sex, the origin, the age of the enslaved or the slaveholder, I have been reading both judicial cases and local notary records. I approach a notarial legajo, and those of us I'm looking at my, right, a big legajo like a text and I read the bound books as narratives, noting when the notary left blank pages, the relationship between the documents, and the modifications of formulaic language. <coughs> Reading, rather than counting, has made me question what these types of numbers can mean. So I have become suspicious of numbers, even when I'm counting, <laughs> which kind of fits with my personality as well. So first, how do we as historians know our counts are correct, given that notarial records, like texts, are more narrative than numerical? For example, in 1688, there are two different manumission documents for Leonor Vela. One is recorded in February 29th, and the other in April 7th. And I've given you both of them on your document there. And in these two records, we can see that her husband, Cristobal Cortez, a part of Libre, and Leonor Vela are working out a deal with her owner, Maria Bella, who has them in a pretty tight spot because she knows that Leonor uh, wants to be free. 
she's asking to not only replace Leonor, but give her some cash, and also that Leonor will continue to serve in the household after she is legally free. Therefore, at first, she's making all of these series of demands. But in the second letter, when the exchange of Leonor Vela for the newly arrived captive Maria has actually occurred, and in this letter, it is a transaction is occurring. You can see the notary is saying, I, the notary, have witnessed that Maria has been brought from the house of the slave trader and being, is being given and replaced Leonor Vela. It is unclear if Leonor Vela will continue to serve in her former ho owner's household, given that she's married to this free man of color who is a militia leader. So my point is here that notarial records provide us with more of a narrative of manumission of an event that occurred over a period of time. And counting them as one specific event makes me nervous because I find them in multiple different times, especially in a small place like Thurgeel. Again, by reading the notarial records, documents that are usually just counted, what I found that in order to affix their position, enslaved and free people attempted to move discussions of money and their commercial relations with slaveholders into the written record. A slaveholder assumed the authorship of the official manumission agreement composed by a notary on paper with a royal seal signed by witnesses. Now, to my second example, Free people were even in a stronger position when they paid for a separate notarized debt agreement that followed their manumission later in the notarial book's subsequent folio. So if you look at this, this is the official manumission letter, but the next page is the debt agreement between the woman who is being freed and she authors this notarial record. Now, what's interesting about here, here is just actually, oh, duh, I should read these notarial records because on the next page is actually even more interesting information about the manumission. With these and other documents, free people could counter ex-slaveholders who attempted to change the agreed price of their freedom, which actually happened quite frequently. Documenting exchanges of funds or agreements of debts and payments also allowed enslaved people to identify their relationship with their slaveholders and ex-owners as more financial than familiar, more capitalist than paternalistic. And in these two separate documents, you can also see how Catalina de Risco employs the notarial record to record her debt. And when I started to read hundreds of these formulaic notarial transactions as part of connected texts, I could see how an enslaved free people were like Catalina de Risco transforming their identity from Negra to Morena. So she's called Negra in the document that her slaveholder uh, creates, but she calls herself Morena in the document that she creates. I don't think this is just something that happens. So they're changing their name, and they're becoming indebted, but they're engaging in the markets as subjects rather than objects. And so I have now read, say this with pride, as many of you historians in the room, I have read all the notarial books in Trujillo between 1640 and 1720. And I think I'm beginning to painstakingly reconstruct enslaved and free family history that otherwise remain, as Michelle Rolfe Trio notes, silenced by the archives and the historian. I'm correlating entries for individuals and then reconstructing genealogies that should not really be able to be documented based on evidence provided by all these little pieces of information, right? As such, I've come to see that counting the emission agreements does not answer what the current historiography is suggesting, that manumission was a process and one that did not equal freedom. So through this micro-historical approach, I've also become simultaneously enamored and suspicious of the law. And that's why I'm here at the JCB. Now, I agree that enslaved and free people were legal agents. This is what the current historiography has been kind of arguing. And developed what Herman Bennett has described as legal consciousness. Now, simultaneously, though, I've been thinking about, and I would argue, that enslaved and free people also understood the limitations of criminal prosecution 
civil cases and inheritance law that in slavery constructed them both as persons and property, emasculating men and dishonoring, dishonoring women. Now, admittedly, this scholarship of slaves' double identity is focused on 19th century US slavery. This is uh, Ariella Gross. And instead, in colonial Spanish America, Catholic understandings of charity, early modern ideas of subjecthood, a credit economy to created a distinct early modern legal landscape. And that's the one I intend to map here while I'm at the JCB. But I think for today's presentation, the theoretical point still stands. Enslaved people were aware, and that's what I'm trying to show you in this destabilization, of their shared or cleaved location between an object of property and agency. And more specifically, enslaved people understood how courts and the law and the notary was a site of violence. And in the case of colonial Spanish America, the mandates of slavery and manumission were rooted in a protection of patriarchal dominion and designed to police extreme abuses of slaveholders. But the law, or the customary law, was not to threaten slaveholders' claims to property. So let me start to think about, number two, slaveholding within the household. My larger project draws attention to how enslaved people achieved manumission. So let me focus on how men and women work to change the course of their freedom process. My point in this second section of my talk is that enslaved people knew that legal manumission was unstable. They knew that this kind of game was happening. And they knew that they were acting as people, not property, of the multi-jurisdictional early modern Atlantic Pacific world. Now what's at stake is charting the relationship of enslaved and free people of the African diaspora status to the Spanish colonial state. Enslaved and free men and women in colonial Spanish America could claim a corporate status as Catholics. And in this capacity, enslaved Africans and their descendants called on ecclesiastical courts to protect their marriage. In, in Spanish America, the enslaved also exercised judicial personas. They served as witnesses in colonial courts. They initiated suits against abusive owners. They employed the judiciary to protect their own goals. But what I think is worth noting is that African descent men do not op occupy a republic, a legal location that provided Indians and Spaniards as a separate civil collectivity. <coughs> They did not have access to their own courts, their own parishes, and their own laws, as did kind of other civil collectivities around them. Spanish and Spanish descent elites excluded women of African descent from honorable status. And at the same time, especially during the mid-colonial period, economic success was allowing particularly women of African descent to become critical participants in the marketplace. And men of African descent repeatedly were calling on the crown to recognize their service as a sign of loyalty to dispute or claim tribute payments. In other words, they're pushing themselves into this civil location. The 17th century, at least in Spanish America, appears to be a critical transition when the enslaved or those associated with slavery are ambiguously located neither of the state nor external to the polity. The key is to remember that the colonial political situation, and if we reorder the influences from the crown to the slaveholders, it's not the crown that's ordering this around, it's the slaveholders. It's not the metropole that's ordering this around, it's what's happening in the colonies. If we follow Tamar Herzog's suggestion that legal mandates were not imposed from above, but generated from below, then in the 17th century, my move is that the sphere of influence would have been, at least in this particular location, the slaveholding household, right? That this is where the slaveholders are kind of holding their own. To underline why I'm attending so much to household, Vincent Brown, Walter Johnson, and Laurent Dubois, among others, have called on scholars to not continually prove, but assume that enslaved and free people responded politically, collectively, and intellectually to enslavement and racial violence. So I think the task now remains to expand the scope of what we mean by enslaved and free politic, right? I think they've gotten us so far as historians of slavery, 
But what about the charged and productive spaces of the domestic that I actually see reflected in current and emerging work on African American women's history? I read Tara Hunter's book years ago and my mind exploded, right? In addition, historians of colonial Latin America have demonstrated how the private constituted the public, as well as the overlapping nature of public and private authority. I wish to suggest that in the mid-colonial urban Spanish America, negotiations of freedom were located in the household sphere. And this is just as a minor footnote, the household sphere constituted the model of dependency that governed state hierarchies. The Spanish early modern state enacted a patriarchal structure where their father king oversaw his vassals as children. And this was replicated in viceregal and magisterial authority. The household then was where the enslaved were required to enact obedience in exchange for their owner's benevolence. And then the domestic, where a slaveholder's death could separate enslaved families, generates an effective violence within slavery. In response, enslaved and free women and men refused paternalistic oversight, employed slaveholders' need for loyalty, and found spaces of negotiation within their intimate status. So I'm seeing this connection between how this state from below and these household negotiations are happening, and I want to think about them together. The reason why I want to think about them together is, as much as I'm suspicious of law, I've been reading law, right? Iberian law made the slaveholder the head of household, right? And if you don't need to see this, but what I want to call attention to is that we not just need to pay attention to the siete partidas, but the fourth, I feel like, the fourth partida of the siete partidas. The laws of slavery in the Spanish Americas followed the siete partidas promulgated by Alfonso X around 1265 and confirmed of law in 1505. And laws regulating slavery and manumission were contained primarily in the fourth partida. And when you really look at the fourth partida, this is the book related to matrimony that contained regulations of concubine, illegitimate children, adoption, and vassalage, and intertwining slaveholding with concerns over inheritance and locating the slaveholders, the patriarch. Title 12 explains that enslaved women could be concubines and required fathers to support illegitimate offspring, but not adopt emancipated slaves as sons. Also, the relationship of slavery extended into legal manumission. The, the ninth title of the fourth partida indebted the former slave to the owner, who in turn became a patron to the freed person. The patron could re-enslave the former slave, now a debtor, if he or she was not properly deferent. And then the Americas, this customary law of many mission developed, and the enslaved had the ability to purchase their freedom or secure what I'm talking about, these notarized manumission letters. So understanding the law of many mission within the household as the fourth party that gives it to us, as well as the role of customary practice in the America has allowed me to see the power of domestic politics. And then my reading of these notarial records and judicial cases in Trujillo on the, on the Peruvian Notar Coast indicates that enslaved people or their proxies had to first obtain permission from their owners to pursue legal manumission. And slave owners could put off this request. They could agree or not disagree. Slaveholders could change the price, and apparently did, to pay for their manumission. And slave people had to borrow from their former owners. Mm -hmm. And payments for slaveholding extended into freedom, as enslaved people continually had to work in households where they had formerly been enslaved. Slaveholders recorded their intentions to many, many enslaved people from their households with a line in their will where they claimed what they claimed counted as an official manumission agreement. But wills could be revised by the, by the ones give, making the wills, ignored by heirs, and not properly notarized. And enslaved and free people knew this. So for example, in a 1700 civil suit, Francisco Arrara explained that in exchange for 500 pesos, the executor of his owner was supposed to have freed him because he had saved his owner's life. Um, and the agreement had been arranged within the slaveholder's household with enslaved witnesses. 
and been made more notorious when a priest and a notary had also witnessed the intentions. But the owner's heir did not respond to Francisco Agarra's lawsuit, and the owner had freed another slave, but listed only Francisco Agarra in his property. So without explicitly naming that he wished to manumit Francisco Agarra, the manumission was left incomplete due to the slaveholders and his son's extension of his household control. What's happening is slaveholders are acting as rulers of their own realms, regardless of what the <coughs> slave people are trying to do. Slaveholders formulaically claim that their love for enslaved children trumped that of their biological parents. Slaveholders cast older slaves as in roles of surrogate mothers or fathers in some kind of effective construction that kept them tied to the slaveholder's household. While part of many missions notarized formula or judicial language, the discourse created and reinforced slaveholders' positions as patriarchs or widows acting in this capacity. So I have another instance where a former slaveholder argued that because he raised Petrona and loved her, she was his slave. And he explained that Petrona kept his wife company, she often slept in her room or her bed, and the slaveholder couple claimed to have educated Petrona, tending to her illnesses and maintaining her in her home, as a parent would do with their child. When Petrona's father, her biological father, said, no, she's free, and I'm her dad, right? The slaveholder couple co demanded payment for their expenses. So in their role as protectors, they erased the purview of African descent men and women over their families, making themselves into parents and guardians in this domestic role. They are extending the household. So number three, how do you transgress the household? And I, I'll see that I'll avoid my Zizak uh, <laughs> mimicking, right? How do you transgress the household? To challenge slaveholding then, I'm kind of arguing that you have to transgress the household in action and documentation. Um, and free people knew this. They knew that they needed to have documents, they controlled themselves, and they needed to move outside the domestic. Not just physically, but actually kind of discursively and effectively. Pedro Angola explained that his owner had died too quickly to render his wishes in writing, and the, but the owner had declared in front of many people that the enslaved men would, would be free. He, Pedro Angola provided witnesses, but to gain his freedom, he also has his performance of paternalistic expectation recorded. According to Trujillo's bailiff, following the owner's granting of manumission, the negro Pedro came into the room, got on his knees, and gave thanks to his owner. So in doing so, Pedro Angola acknowledged the slaveholder's authority, one continuing after death, right? Pedro Angola won his freedom, right? He performed the paternalistic obedience. He had it recorded and witnessed, right? And he, he enacted this. So freedom then required that enslaved and free people recall and feel gratitude for the generosity of their ex-owner, much like faithful vassals of a protector ruler. In these performances, slaveholders played the role of a benevolent father who had the right to punish their slaves within limits, like a good king, but could also grant pardons and favors. I'm starting to think of freedom as a favor, as a pardon. I also have examples here of enslaved and free people who came to rely on ecclesiastical documentation, <coughs> getting themselves baptized in indigenous villages in order to prove that they are free. This was really highly um, effective because they could pay the priest to have their children baptized, and then they used that to prove to the owner that the child was free. I have one case where the uh, one family, enslaved and free family, had such a big party at the time of the baptism that the slaveholder could not say that it did not happen because witnesses came to the court and said, that was such an awesome party, <laughs> and we all remember it, that that child is free. So, in conclusion, what does it mean to pay attention to domestic? What does it demonstrate? A, when enslaved and free men and women engaged with the practices of manumission, they indicated that they had legal abilities 
as well as they understood the logic of early modern slavery. Enslaved and free people were actors within the law of slavery and manumission, they, but simultaneously excluded as full subjects given their value as property. I'm following W.E.B. Du Bois here, and I would argue that enslaved people articulated their freedom from a double-sided position or a location of double consciousness, where they understood that records could often specify long-term obligations that further tied free people to their former slaveholders while seizing on the tools of literacy for their own ends, even as they remained aware of writing's traps. By creating their own forms of documentation, free people challenged the authority of slaveholders and also then a foundational discourse of empire. If the Spanish crown relied on local elites to govern, and these local elites were slaveholders, and customary practice served as colonial law, then enslaved and free challenges to slaveholders struck at the everyday mechanisms of empire. Second, the domestic reveals how enslaved and free people articulated visions of freedom that include separating, because I'm still asking, well, what is freedom? In variety of forms from their owners and patrons. Enslaved people understood that a legal manumission could allow them to decide when to raise their children and when and where to engage in their own economic pursuits. Now, when people become free, what I'm seeing more and more is that they engage in leadership roles in the confraternities and then they become godparents and creditors in the 17th century and they claim the status of vecinos and vecinas or municipal citizens even though theoretically they cannot, right? They, they officially cannot, only Spaniards can, and Karen Graubart has shown that urban Andeans do. For free people of color, a vecino or vecina are the municipal citizen who owned property and was or had been honorably married and assumed a public role meant something. Freedom then maybe meant that a woman or a man was no longer a dependent or a member of another person's household. A free person could be counted on to secure their own creditors, to stand behind their own word, to answer for themselves and their own household. And therefore, the attainment of freedom in colonial Trujillo on the northern coast of Peru was about a legal transaction that you can count and an exchange of funds, but also part of a lengthy process that could result in the establishment of a civil person, a free person, who, read, who wielded their own written archives and negotiated commercial transactions of their own effective labor. So, thank you very much. of time for questions, of which I'm sure that there will be many, and uh, comments and cross-geographical cross ge and disciplinary uh, interrogations. Who would like to go first? Hi, um, I'm not surprised. It's a gorgeous talk, very, very fascinating, coming from fascinating scholar. And thank you for that. Um, I'm particularly interested in the specific idea of how um, the law becomes so malleable, mm -hmm. right, in terms of interpretation by different subjects, in this case, uh, slave men and women. And I came across some documents being in the archives in Popayán, mm -hmm. up in the northern part of the Vice Royalty of Peru at some point. And, and I couldn't understand documents that I now kind of interpret better, but I want to ask you about those documents. These are lawsuits filed by slave women, actually, uh, against the, their masters. And they argue, well, they, they describe their relationship as brutal, uh, physically violent, and in one case, at least, they saw, she said, that the master raped her and she became pregnant, right? That she's not asking for any um, compensation for her, for herself. She's instead asking for the freedom of the child, okay? I don't remember exactly what year was this. It must have been sometime in the early 17th century, I'm not sure. But my question then is, to what extent in cases of physical violence, in 
cases of, cases of rape. If the system, the, the legal system was, you know, flexible enough mm -hmm. to allow for the women in particular, and even the men as, as well in other situations, to claim freedom either for their children or for themselves. That's one, one of the things. I don't know if it's just, it's a few documents. I don't have, yeah. you know, like a whole lot to, yeah. to do that. And the other thing is, the other side of the same thing is for the free men. Because being a free man, as you said today, man, being manumitted didn't mean necessarily a whole lot. But I would like you to elaborate a little bit if possible on the um, on the pardos, milicias, milicias de pardos and the milicias, because we see a lot of uh, um, free men making this huge point and effort, investing money, you know, in becoming a member of the Delicious, yeah. which the indigenous peoples also did, yeah. the indigenous nobility. So I wonder if yeah. you can relate that somehow to the point of strategies and, yeah. and responses. Yeah. That, thank you for your talk. No. That's really fascinating. Do you want to take a well, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm not going to answer your question, you know. okay. so, <laughs> um, but I'm going to speak to it, right? I think the first question about rape, because I see that too, is that I'm interested in, and I guess I'm really listening carefully to Karen Graubart and listening really carefully to Mar Herzog, right, and Maria Elena Martinez. Um, that it's about precedent, right? And it's so how does early modern or colonial law in Finnish America build about precedent, right? And how how do men and women, free and enslaved, um, access legal representatives who know about that precedent and know about those different arguments, right? So instead of us trying to find the code or the law, right? And this, you know, here's another plug: the us early modernists need to free our mind from the modernists, right? <laughs> like we're never going to find that because it doesn't really exist for the early modern period. I've just been trying to think a lot about precedent and about kind of how that works instead of trying to trace it all back that it, it was because of the Siete Partidas that it, that it happened that. Because it does really seem like if somebody else made this argument, then I'm going to try to make that argument. Or if my legal representative is going to try to make that argument. Like I'm, I'm wondering a lot about that, right? Um, and the second argument, the second piece about free men I became really intrigued about this, these lines that you can hear in this talk because when I was in Spain last fall and looking through the Audiencia de Lima, as we are all want to do, right? There's no index at all, you just sit there. Um, <laughs> that all of these petitions of free men of color to pay tribute or to otherwise prove their loyalty to the crown. So, Ben Vincent is right, right? There's something that happens in the 18th century about joining the militias, but I also think, wonder, what, how else do free men of color, so they're free, they're legally manumitted, but they also have to free, prove that they are men, that they're vecinos, that they're independent, that they're not dependent, that they're not clients, that they're, and they are doing that through their military service. Like, I saw petitions of men who were like, I served in Panama. And they don't want money, they want recognition that they are loyal and dependable, right? And so that really struck a chord with me about kind of well, what is freedom? Or what does it mean to them? And how are they able to then leverage that honor and reputation into credit or into this, you know, status, right? Because I kept kind of like, why do these guys care? And why, who wants to pay taxes, you know? But yeah. these guys do because it, it shows that they're loyal vassals because there's very few other ways to do that. And that they're rational. And, and they're they rational. Are, and, and human beings. And that know? they, you know, they did it, you know. And so, so I've been thinking a lot about that. So that's not really an answer, but it's okay. a Great. continual, continual love. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, jump in precisely on that because you were talking about the men being loyal and dependable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the second example that you have struck me as very interesting that she's 
man admitted and then immediately goes into debt, right? And a person doesn't go into debt and sign with a notary unless they are trustworthy. That would not be granted unless they were trustworthy. So, you know, you're looking at, at testaments and I'm sure prepayment of manumission costs, but these examples where someone goes immediately into debt, I think you might want to play with those as a specific subset. Very nice. And to think about, to think about, as, as to kind of pick on myself as opposed to kind of a, uh, a burden that this is a privilege. Okay. And who who got to who got the privilege of going into debt and who was denied going into debt? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm wondering if this is too early to see. But uh, there are later examples of people who are manumitted conditionally uh, to pay a lien on their future labor. Uh, there's sort of a mortgage, yeah. and they don't any longer have to reside in a household, right. but uh, they do have to pay off to the owner yeah. uh, a certain amount, which is agreed on. Yeah. And until they do that, they can't really leave, they can't act on their own, yeah. and it's, it is a mortgage. Yes. And I don't... I, I know it exists in Brazil, but it doesn't exist here. Yeah, I see that a lot. And I see stipulations in the Carta de Libertad where people say, <coughs> where the condition is, this is the total cost, and you will pay in these installments, and you will not be able to leave Trujillo until this is paid, right? So there are kind of more, you know, I could have given a whole talk on kind of mortgage, you know. Manumission is a mortgage payment, right? And then gone into all of these different kind of financial arra arrangements that are uh, complicated, and and you will pay my funeral, and you will pay into my um, household goods after I die, and your child will pay into my funeral, and you will, you know, all sort, and it will be at this percentage point, and I mean. Because I think I have to start thinking that this is a credit economy, right? And so people are operating in terms of credit and debt, and that's what the wills are all full of. So, so I've been starting to think like a whole chapter is debt. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, so thank you, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, this talk is really uh, generative. Uh, thinking in terms of, I like to sort of move away from numbers to thinking of these stories and thinking about almost, it's pushing me to think about freedom, sort of comparative freedoms. Um, and what struck me in particular about these stories is how conservative <coughs> this freedom is, sort of in, in, sort of in a really uh, um, uh, sort of ironic uh, function, where we might think of, of, of freedom, especially in the United States or post-revolution, as, as heat on mobility. Right, the ability to move to, to other places. I mean, in the late 18th century, you see where, where especially for African slaves, mobility is always uh, tenuous, that you might have your freedom papers, but they could mean nothing if they're taken away from you or if someone denies them. But here it's very, very closely related to being in a specific juridical setting and staying in that setting. And, 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 and so that, that, that the way you're talking also about writing yourself into a dead economy uh, uh, is, uh, has, is uh, Sort of a, a, a fascinating, fascinating way to be beginning to think about uh, again, sort of comparative freedoms, but freedoms in this context. Is, uh, so we're just curious about your, your thinking about uh, mobility and freedom, and uh, oh. and mobility and the law as, uh, as it relates to freedom in this. In this well, I mean, I think maybe I've written myself into this, you know, conservatism, <coughs> right? Because I guess the other way I've tried to think about this is that, and I read this, this he's got a chapter on men and <coughs> mobility, right? It's that. Um, there's all sorts of, um, there's a relationship that we haven't really seen in historiography between manumission and marriage, right? Yeah. And so women who are engaged in these very processes of manumission will uh, leave Trujillo, give birth to their child, have the child baptized in an indigenous reducción, and then return back and continue on their mortgage payment and just say, you know, I lost the child. But the stipulation was the child will be my slave, right? You are free. So 
it, uh, what I'm trying to, because there's a, my false dichotomy into making this in juridical when people themselves are using fugitive mobility practices as well as these juridical practices. But they do come back also, is that right? I mean, right, it's to not, work it's this angle yeah. while they work that angle as well. So, I mean, I may have done this just because I wanted to kind of work this question out because um, so often when you work with these manumission records, it's about counting, so I really wanted to work that one out. But you're right, I, maybe I worked it out too much. No, no, I'm not sure, because to, yeah. the, to, the, uh, to the extent that, that you say, for example, that the witnessing is so important, I mean, the witnessing is a local, is a local thing, right? So you're tied in, 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 in a way to this, uh, okay. I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the reason, so I think, I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing at all with what you're saying, it's actually no, no. really, uh, really uh, fascinating how this, how, how it, how, I mean, this opening of freedom is, is in a sense contingent on uh, a sort of a, these local structures and local traditions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you
now I'm starting to think about what else is in this economy, what else is being traded in this economy. Um, and it's an economy that's a charity economy. Like, why is it that manumissions are given in, te in testaments? It's when the slaveholders are thinking about this next Catholic economy, which is one after death. Right? Why is it hooked up to people's funerals? Right. So I've been trying to think really. It's not a, in, in you know so many vows equals so many pesos, right? But there's something about this effective economy. That, um, that I don't think it's exclusive to manumission, but I think that this manumission can illuminate, right? So I do think that deference is part of it, but it's all these different parts. And I do think it will allow me to also speak to, do slaveholders tend to um, manumit their children, right? Or are they slaveholders manumitting women who they have sexual relationships with, right? Well. That's not really clear, but someone who's deferent to them or someone who is, right, what about the homosocial relations between slaveholding men and enslaved young men, right? There's something going on there, too. So there's this economy of deference and active affect that I really see in being enacted. And I think that's what this will allow me to do. And for Tissa, yeah, I see that there are particular notaries that they are going to. And you can see it from 1640 to 17. 1720, they are ones that are favored by people of color in Trujillo. And I think it's because they will call so and so a vecino. And they're not supposed to. Right. So I do think the notaries are, and of course, Catherine Byrne, you know, people have made me think of these notaries. I'm not alone in this room of waking up to the notary. Finally. Right? Haley, your question about the domestic and the empire, we just need to talk more because I am just trying to. Um, Think, think through kind of these logics of, um, especially as I'm reading 19th century, as we've talked about 19th century stuff about slavery, both for Latin America and the US, where the state has, takes such a different form. I've been trying to kind of think through that. There's no code here. Right? There's no, there's no, there's no like, uh, there's no state that's kind of showing people up or charting people. But what is happening? So I've just been trying to think about that. And I am really struck by in here at the JCB to kind of read these laws in a different way than I read them like 10 years ago, where I was actually trying to match them up. Now I'm trying to read them as dis, you know, discourses. Why are they? What is the sense of this Spanish law? What is the Spanish law kind of trying to talk about? And man, they are really, it's the dad, <laughs> it's the inheritance chart. And like I was talking with Jim like a month ago, it is inheritance, it is who is the legitimate son and who will inherit. And so, I mean, that's kind of a riff, but I've been trying to get but inspired by that 19th century stuff, but not get caught in it. Well, that, that's uh, in many ways it's the perfect, um, the perfect ending, and also uh, it, it's it's a it, it responds to some degree about the question that I was going to ask, which we can talk about also later. But just as you put up this image of the siete partidas and thinking about uh, in a in a more in, in your your project in many ways is perfect to ask questions about the nature of printed sources versus manuscript notarial sources in the way that we conduct our research today. And it's something, in fact, that we think about a lot from the library's point of view about what it is that we are trying to provide here that is going to complement, uh, that is going to engage, that is going to um, connect with the various different types of resources that pe people are bringing from other kinds of uh, institutions especially in the digital age, uh, when the entire constellation of materials. This is online. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, this is online. Yeah. Some of the materials yeah. that you probably worked in, I'm not sure if in Rubio, but uh, perhaps elsewhere, is also online. Some is not. So we all have very different kinds of um, resource bases. That means that what we do here at a place like the JCB 
inevitably ends up turning toward more toward the conversations that can arise out of our collective knowledge as opposed to, boy, do I really need to sit in the reading room and read these three volumes of this yet they can't feed us. So it's anyway, it's it's a, it's it's fruit for perhaps a longer conversation, but I think that your presentation and the project more generally gives us a lot uh, to think about how those those interactions um, uh, can reveal different things about um, what actually took place in these different and very complicated um, formal and formal relationships. So. Anyway, uh, with that, uh, why don't we thank uh,